Hey there, Lionesses. This is Bobby Carlton. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of Lioness Magazine for the female entrepreneur. I'm also the founder of Innovation Women, an online speaker bureau for women. Today, we are talking with Angelique Mohring. She is the founder and CEO of GainX. GainX uses artificial intelligence to support change and transformation within corporations. Welcome, Angelique. Thank you. Welcome. Or <laughs> I am so happy okay. to be here. I am so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us today. You have had such an amazing journey. I love to start out by learning how an archaeology major <laughs> with a minor in anthropology ends up running a tech company. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It was a bit of a zigzag um, journey. The thing I think that um, can can um, provide that bridge over um, two and a half decades is um, in anthropology and archaeology, you can't become an archaeologist um, without becoming an anthropologist. So um, the beautiful thing about it is it... Um, teaches you to keep the human at the center of everything that you're doing. It also um, taught me how to be able to step back and as much as humanly possible approach today's challenges objectively. So when you fast forward 25 years and you're looking at things like the application of artificial intelligence in our market to help drive greater economic growth, there's actually quite a bridge of trying to understand, well, where does the human um, fit in this? When I was an archaeologist, um, I would reconstruct economic trade routes and um, understand how economically healthy different communities were based on the trade, based on um, mortuary practices, which sounds kind of grim, but um, these cultures were over a thousand years old and it was incredibly fascinating to be able to reconstruct these one, it was, I would call it one fragment at a time. And now it's one data point at a time that we're bringing together. Um, AI allows us to do that on scale, but very much some of the, the same principles and thinking involved. That's fascinating. All right. So Tell me about GainX and how does it work? What do you do for customers? Ah, so um, we are a platform that is um, exclusively designed for leaders and executives in medium to large organizations. And the software will predict the outcome of any strategy um, with uh, with some, with some, I guess, advancements that we put into play over the last year, it also allows organizations and leaders to more effectively change while they're taking costs out. So it identifies opportunities to take costs out of an organization, whether it's consolidating um, teams or resources or programs, um, finding duplicate work, understanding how a clay layer works inside of an organization, um, it gets quite specific. So it starts at a global level. Here's how you're doing with your strategy and how well you're likely to deliver it. And then it goes into what the root cause analysis are that's happening to drive either, either a better strategy or poor delivery. Wow. Okay. That's huge. I mean, it sounds like you're working with, you know, companies, large organizations mostly, right? We do. We do. I mean, uh, I think on the low end would be about a 5,000 person organization. We can work with smaller companies, but we tend to focus on organizations that are um, either global or um, quite complex in their nature. So you can have 5,000 people, um, but be a multi-billion dollar company that's quite complex in what you're trying to continuously bring to your customers. Um, and I, it's just our belief that it's no longer humanly possible to manage that complexity as a leader. And so we, um, we exist to be able to support them. Gotcha. So are there lessons that you've learned that we can share with smaller firms as well? Um, I think so. I think absolutely. I, I think every organization has what I playfully, although it costs a lot of money for organizations, but I playfully um, call clay layers, um, bringing my archaeology days 
um, just back into what we do in Gain X. But intuitively, everybody knows what a clay layer is. Um, it's that part of the organization that isn't getting the information that they need to do their jobs effectively. You can have a clay layer for many different reasons. You can have it because your organization has change fatigue, because you've got lifers that, you know, they, they just want out in the next two years, um, because you've just done an M&A or you've got some broken processes. There's a number of reasons why that clay layer or permafrost is what some people will call it forms inside of organizations. And I think once you hit over 50 people, you've got a clay layer. <laughs> Understanding how people are working together and how they're aligning to what you are trying to do, even as a small organization, um, is worth its weight in gold in terms of an investment. Because one of the things that we do is we quantify what those inefficiencies cost. And in large organizations, they cost tens to hundreds of millions of dollars or pounds. Um, so when you, if you go from a 50,000 person to an organization down to a five, just take off the 10X factor and understand that it's still costing you hundreds of thousands of, of dollars or pounds. So I always say that it's the human at the center, but we're really focused on helping organizations not just understand what the implications are of trying to work with um, the people that they have, whether it's hybrid working or the workforce to the future, but quite specifically how it affects their ability to deliver against strategy, because ultimately that's what executives are held accountable for. Mm -hmm. So we always bring it back to what does the executive need to achieve um, and what are the underlying reasons that they might not be achieving it? And we um, bring it back to that human component. So um, for a small company, I think I would bring it there is you can't, I don't think you can invest too much in making sure that everyone understands why they come into work every day. Mm, fascinating. And these days, a lot of strategies were obviously being impacted by the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, how did the pandemic impact you and your company? Um, you know, I think in two ways. One was um, certainly it, it stalled sales because the entire world just went on hold, right? And it stalled um, the appetite for organizations temporarily to buy artificial intelligence or software that, you know, isn't well known um, to to the market. So we felt it. However, the other thing I have to admit that I felt was I built the product for this moment, to be honest, not for the pandemic, but for the moment that we get to where we understand we're in the age of the network, everything is connected. And we're seeing that in our supply chains. We're seeing it in how not having a team showing up for work in Singapore is affecting a team that's dependent on them in Toronto or New York. So um, being able to, because we look at data across an entire organization and bring the insights either globally or with very quick drill down um, for our, our clients, when we um, when we started to feel this pain and we did absolutely adjust some of our roadmap and build some new features, um, I just realized that we've got an opportunity now to um, not only be top of market, but to own the market category. So we're creating the market category that we're in um, and we're bringing in some of the biggest companies in the world. So negatively, but ultimately for a company like ours, positively because we help organizations and leaders manage complexity. Wow. Now you, you mentioned two words that of course make my little journalistic ears perk up. You said new features. Mm -hmm. What, what new stuff are you bringing to market with this? Thank you for asking that. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's ex the exciting stuff, right? Um, I, so I realized when, you know, in early 2020, when I think, uh, I, I don't mean to think to imply I was the only one that realized it, I think it became very obvious that we were going to see a shift in economic priorities and a shift in buying priorities and spending priorities inside of organizations um, because of the impact that um, this has had on our economy globally. So when we thought about new features, we recognized that by helping organizations transform, 
which is where we started, right? That ability to predict any strategy. There's no strategies out there that um, don't involve some form of transformation. Every single medium to large organization has it in their top three strategic components. What we recognized was um, that's going to be underpinned by cost savings. So it's even more pressure for leaders. You've got to transform because we're now in a new world. So we already knew we had to transform before COVID. 70% of transformation and initiatives um, were failing. It's a two trillion dollar a year spend and it's growing. So this is not, you know, this is big ec economic impact. So we added features that allow organizations and leaders to immediately look at where they can find cost savings. And we deliver these insights within days of receiving the data. And insights can include, again, tens to hundreds of millions of dollars or pounds in, in findings. So the focus is cost out, cost savings, um, things like duplicate work. Every organization has five to 10 to 15% in duplicate work, but it's like finding a needle in a haystack if you're a human being, right? Whereas we can find it within days. Things like um, we identify similarity clusters. So if you're scattered across 90 different countries and we can look at 10 or 20,000 people and identify where they're doing similar work, you've got a phenomenal opportunity to consolidate. Um, other features include the ability to measure productivity, which is unbelievably important today with hybrid working and look at how, and we predict it, we can predict, um, the software will predict whether or not it's going to increase or decrease in certain areas and then what that systemic relationship is. So if productivity is decreasing in New York, we can show you the impact it might be having in London um, as a result. So these are pretty profound um, new features. There's several other ones too, but again, it's really to provide decision intelligence for executives and to enable them a bit, uh, a bit more than they are today. Wow. And with that, I almost like said, Ooh, you know, do you have the ability with using your product to give us real insight into whether the new world of work from home or work from anywhere really is productive or not productive? Absolutely. Absolutely. Wow. And we can look historically too. So this is what it was like pre-COVID. Um, and this is what it's like today. And this is what the software is predicting. And, you know, my opinion might not be well received. Um, I just had this conversation yesterday with um, some, some people who feel that productivity has gone up with, um, the work from home and hybrid working model. And I, I think that's a false positivity, meaning it might've gone up initially, right? Because um, I don't have to commute two hours into work anymore, or I don't have to go pick up my kids um, because they're homeschooling or whatever it might be. But the fact is, you know, in my own personal home, I'm about 20 feet away from my kitchen, um, right? So I don't have that. I'm going to, you know, between client meetings now, I'm going to go grab a cup of coffee and make a few phone calls and so on. So the work, the work focus, I'm, I'm saying things we all know is so much more intense. Um, I, I think there's a whole other conversation about what it's like for women and the additional work that we're taking on as women that I see. Um, but what we're also seeing is burnout and we're seeing the impact on um, a human being's well-being um, getting significantly impacted. We measure organizational health. We measure what that network health looks like um, in a multitude of ways. So, and by the way, we never look at an individual. We keep it at the group level so that there's never a way that um, it can be reflected negatively on an individual. But to understand that what looks like positivity because I might be working 10 hours is only maybe five hours of productivity and, and my mental health is being impacted or um, how much I care about my job or my ability to collaborate um, or think creatively is declining. I, I, I think we're seeing those things. It's just, it's really hard to evidence them right now. So that is absolutely something that we can help to address. Wow. So um, you mentioned a little bit about you know, the role of women in workplace and you know the things that we are hearing with a lot of women working. Um, you're also a member of the UN's AI for Good Committee. Mm -hmm. Like, How is the company getting involved in topics like 
privacy and fairness and, and bias in data? Yeah, so I think that's such an important question for every AI company out there. And I, it is my belief that we have a responsibility to build ethical and profitable companies. Um, I, I really struggle with the way uh, that some organizations are built today. So um, I'm not the only voice out there that is saying that the cost, the human cost of AI is unbelievably high and we're not recognizing it when we look at the profit that organizations make. So one of the things that we're doing is we're creating um, a center of excellence for organizations to be able to plug in. We're going to launch that in 2022. Um, and it is designed to help leaders and executives understand how to better leverage technology um, across their organizations for profit, but without it um, or with, with a different way of considering what profit can look like. So an example, not that I mean to call out any particular companies, but there's a, one organization that we all tend to really love the 24 hour delivery um, when, you know, when we want, I mean, whatever, <laughs> name it. And uh, for many people in large cities, it's even same day delivery. What we don't consider when we do that multiple times a week, even multiple times a month, is the human cost um, behind this now multi-billion dollar company in which the CEO decided to go to space <laughs> for some of that, that profitable spending. I know we're, we all know I'm talking about Amazon. Um, I think Amazon and other organizations as well could really take a leadership role in thinking about profit in new ways. And that actually requires a huge cultural shift in the way shareholders think as well. And we're starting to see that. How do we define profit when we're looking at what's the well-being of our, our um, humans inside of our organization? What's the environmental impact? And, and so on and so on. And so what is GainX doing? We've actually created a new category within those. Um, you can see them oftentimes as discussion points. It's almost like everybody's cutting and pasting the EU guidelines for um, AI and ethics. We're really drilling into the bias component too. Um, we've got dedicated people on our development team that um, have taken AI and ethics courses at the London School of Economics. Um, and they bring it internally to teach our development team. When we launch the Center of Excellence, they will be able to teach other development teams to think about, because most developers don't think about it. They build what you ask them to build, right? And they think about what's the most effective way to build it, not with considering how this um, technology might be used either correctly or incorrectly. So lots that I've answered there, Bobby, in terms of what we're doing, Center of Excellence, um, adding to how we think about um, artificial intelligence, ethics, fairness, bias, um, the use, and then um, certainly putting those practices and processes into our own organization, but now we're going to start sharing them with other organizations. Wow. Hey, you're talking about sharing, you know, some incredibly valuable information and, you know, a lot of companies, they're very competitive and it's like, we're going to keep this you know, close to the vest, yes. you know, I think some of this really speaks to, you know, your sense of responsibility for the world at large. Can you share a little bit of, of your, why, why did you create this company? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Um, so I think there was a few reasons. Um, I love this question. It might be one of my favorite questions. Um, so given that this is an, an audience primarily for women and kudos to the men that come into these and listen, I love every one of you. Um, one of the reasons was I got really tired of the glass ceiling, if I'm honest. Um, I was a bit surprised to find out the glass ceiling in terms of fundraising is even thicker than it is working in technology as an executive. Um, but that's, you know, our access to one to 3% of all funding is a different conversation, a different podcast someday. But um when was the glass ceiling? And I, I actually enjoy um, building things. And um, I, I really liked the idea of trying to create an enterprise software company. I combined 25 years of experience, or at the time, I guess it was closer to, um, to 20, of, you know, and, 
an archaeologist and anthropologist who went into consulting who found myself in technology for quite some time, always working in this horizontal view. And I wanted to build a company that um, I, would, I would just never be bored in, right? I wanted to solve an almost impossible problem to solve in the world and know that, gosh, this is, I will always be learning. It's one of my, it's just one of my passions. The other thing was, um, I, I currently live in Kitchener, Waterloo in Canada. This is where BlackBerry was based. All of us probably know the story of BlackBerry. I have moved 26 times in my life. So if you ask me where I'm from, it's a very difficult thing for me to answer. Um, but I do feel Canadian at heart. I've lived all over the world in, in six countries. When I was here, BlackBerry was at its peak and um, BlackBerry also completely crashed. And a couple of things really struck me. Um, BlackBerry was responsible for, I don't even know how many soccer fields and arenas and walking paths. They're also responsible because of their wealth and the people that were in BlackBerry um, for the creation of um, what's called the Quantum Physics Institute here. It's one of my favorite things. You go to public lectures and I walk out thinking I understood, you know, 2% of 98 of what, what they covered, but it was so fascinating. And there's only two in the world. And the reason I'm sharing that is you see what large organizations contribute at a local level, at a, you know, a state um, level, at a national level, and then internationally, what these big companies can contribute. I know that, you know, there are awful things that these big companies do and that they, they, we have to call them to task to be even better. But when you watch a big organization absolutely implode the way that BlackBerry did and see the impact it can have on local communities, I just thought I can remember sitting in a partner company looking at BlackBerry years before it was, it imploded thinking they have a lot of challenges um, that are that have the, the potential of um, risking their ability to stay a market leader. Now, everybody has, has um, 2020 hindsight. So I don't mean to imply that I'm, you know, some futurist thinker, but I have enough experience in my career to be able to look at a company and think they might not make it. Um, and I just decided that, well, what if I brought all of this experience together and put it into a platform so I could help more than one company at a time. And in the company I was in, I was helping them make hundreds of millions in additional revenue and savings. So part of my why is because um, I think that we genuinely need to support these large organizations. All the previous conversations I've shared, we've got to call them to task on some of their ethics and how they grow, but we got to keep them alive because they're good for all of us and they're good for our economy. Wow. That is an awesome why. I support that why. <laughs> All right. So as we come to a little bit of a close today, maybe you could share some advice from one successful businesswoman to all of our audience here, the women entrepreneurs and those men who show up. I love them too. <laughs> what should they take away from our conversation today to impact their future successes? Hmm. What should they take away from our conversation today? I, I would hope that, um, so I'm going to guess that your listeners are already big thinkers. Um, I love meeting women that are big thinkers. Um, you know, I have set out from the very beginning to go build a multi-billion dollar slash pound, sorry, we're headquartered in the UK right now, um, organization. And that catches a lot of people off guard, right? Because if you build a company and sell it for 30 million, wow, that's an incredible accomplishment. I found it unbelievable that last week, one of my board members called me to task and said, you're not thinking big enough. And he said, you, you need to be the gorilla in this room. And I, I was so grateful because I was like, wow, <laughs> there's something bigger. And there was, and the way that he positioned a vision for me made me understand that I was actually missing a big piece of what we can do as an organization and a company. So what does that mean for women that are listening? Trust me, you can go bigger. Trust me, you can. And, and not, you know, high octane, burn yourself out bigger. I have seen so many men 
just dream so enormously big and not think twice about it. I know we're, we're um, more risk adverse. I know we're more conservative in how we manage things. And I have to say, I just watched an organization raise the same amount, of, sorry, five times the amount of money that I just raised and they're out of business within two months. And it blows my mind away, right? And they, and they were smaller and it's run by men. So it's not that they all happen that way, but I just thought, I wonder what would have happened if somebody a little bit more risk adverse in terms of how to conservatively manage what you get, but still have those goals in, in place would do. And look, I mentor and I coach a lot of women. And the number one thing that I see is um, they don't, they just don't go for the gold, get up on the podium and just don't compromise just go for the gold and know that, that you can do it. And it's okay if it takes a bit longer than, you know, people might expect it always does. Um, but yeah, go big. That's my, that's my advice. That's what I would hope that they would take from listening is you can solve big things um, and, and do big things. All of us can. That it sounds like amazing, fantastic, awesome advice. Mm -hmm. So any other things you'd like to add in today before we say goodbye? Yeah, I think there's one more. I think that um, one of the things that we all struggle with as women is putting ourselves first. And, and I mean this in a number of different ways from our health to our well-being to um, taking time just to read a book instead of trying to learn something new. Um, I've had multiple um, traumatic brain injuries, including a very significant car accident um, close to six years ago that almost wiped my, me and my company out. Um, and then I got another one after that. I healed after um, five years. I got another one a year ago. I'm telling you the struggle of trying to build a business or keep it alive and manage my health really, really came into conflict. Um, and I ultimately finally decided that instead of them being equal priorities, my health will continue and always be number one. And the fascinating thing that I found happening in my life is everything else got more successful anyways, including my business. So, you know, me not compromising for um, the early morning meetings because I'm stuck in Canada, stuck in Canada, I say that lightly, with a, a company in the UK five hours ahead of me so that I can get my workout in is now something I don't compromise anymore and eating well and taking time to read a fiction book. Anyway, that's a long answer, Bobby, to say, put yourself first and I promise you everything will follow anyway. That was awesome. All right, folks. So Angelique Moring, she's the founder and CEO of Gain X, and she has been here today to inspire you all. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you for having me, Bobby. That was fun.